Live Better and Longer with The Fitness Show, hosted by fitness expert, author, and TV personality, Fitz Kohler. She'll tell you why diets are dumb, supplements are snake oil, and the truth about how you can earn a lean, hard, pain-free, and athletic body. Now for our favorite bossy blonde, Fitz Kohler. Hi team, I'm Fitz Kohler, your heart healthy fitness pro from fitness.com and welcome to the fitness show. Today I am bursting at the seams because I have a man with so much fantastic information in his head that I'm excited to get into your head, transfer into your head. As many of you know, as the intro of my show states, I I want to show you why diets are dumb and supplements are snake oil and the truth about earning a lean, hard body that you can feel good about. And this guy has all the information. And yeah, I have a master's in exercise and sports sciences, but his degrees are way more interesting and impressive than mine. And he's actually a true hero. You've met him on a previous episode of the fitness show where he saved two of my runners lives. I call them my runners because as you know, when you run my races, I... I claim you and I love you. And uh, yeah, if you haven't done so yet, go back and listen to the miracle at the Monterey Bay half marathon show. It's just mind blowing. But anyways, we're going to talk about weight loss, weight loss, drugs, nutrition, why some of these diets are so dumb. And then also we're going to talk about saving the schlongs. That's right. We don't always have a lot of penis pecker weenie talk on the fitness show, but today we are going to do it, and I am pumped. If you haven't done so yet, please leave a review on the Fitness Show. Give me a rating, hopefully a nice one, and then come say hi at Fitness on social media. Here is the guy I'm so excited about. He is Chief of Cardiology at the Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula, Dr. Stephen Loam. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for having me again. Oh, my gosh. You know what? It was... I mean, obviously, I loved you from the start, right? The second I heard your name, it was greatest guy in the world. But then after our last interview, I looked on your YouTube channel. And Mm -hmm. then I I just, I got more excited and more excited as we go along. Tell folks about your YouTube channel as we get started. Well, yeah, it was just uh, my passion to spread the message of lifestyle medicine and plant-based diets and exercise and all that. And, you know, as a cardiologist, I feel like I am lucky to have that platform uh, and I learned a lot through all my uh, training that I had to kind of do on my own because most doctors don't learn this stuff in their traditional medical training. And so I said, well, how could I reach the largest audience? And I, um, I, you know, I gave presentations at little hospitals and other places. And I'm like, no, 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 YouTube, that's the place to go, right? Because you can reach the whole world. And so um, actually my kids convinced me to, to do the YouTube channel. And so I started putting up videos on um uh, you know, heart disease prevention, and, and it kind of it's gone into different directions and interesting topics. And um, unfortunately, uh, it's been hard to maintain uh, being a cardiologist, chief of cardiology, medical director, very busy with the clinical practice. I have six kids at home as well and family life. I haven't really pushed it enough, but uh, I put up my first dozen videos in 2019 and got something like 13,000 subscribers within a couple months. Uh, and then it stopped for a few years until recently I put some more up. But I think it's a great way to get out good evidence based medicine. Uh, so I always emphasize that everything I talk about is referencing uh, the major guidelines from American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. There's so much misinformation out there. I try to help people navigate through all that and and get to the scientific truth about what to do to be healthy and live a a long life. Well, and, and, and isn't that important? It's funny to me in my industry, my industry is actually kind of ugly. It's kind of fantastic. And then it's kind of hideous. There's all these frauds, fakes, phonies, vultures that may look hot in a swimsuit, but they're just out to gouge you, to steal your money, to sell the the miracle diet and these magic pills. And uh, it, it's so unethical. It's I really, in my dreams, I would be able to go around and pop everybody in the nose who did stuff like that. But it's a real case of buyer beware. You have to know who you're taking advice from and where you're gonna get the actual truth. And, and you certainly are one of those valid resources. Yeah, it is. It is very unfortunate that, you know, some people are good looking and charismatic and they have a bunch of credentials after their name, but they're not really telling the truth. They're in it for the money. Uh, they don't. Uh, there's one 
person who I won't name was like, don't eat beans. Beans have lectins. Oh, but you know what? You could buy my lectin blocking supplement. If you want to eat some beans, it's $100 a month on my website. Come get it. Then you could eat beans. Uh, it's like, uh, it's, and people do it, uh, which is unfortunate because, uh, you know, you could tell a good story and twist the science around in certain ways to make uh, people who don't have, you know, the proper education in regards to science and nutrition, you can make them believe these types of things. Uh, and it's wrong. And I feel like there should be consequences for people who really spread this misinformation because literally people can die uh, if they do these wrong things, things like, you know, keto diets and such long term uh, can be very risky. And um, and it's sad that it's out there and that people have to try to navigate through all that misinformation. And so I always try to point people the right way towards the major authorities and the, and the guidelines and uh, explain why the guidelines say what they do and the science behind it all. Yeah. And I yeah. do think the consequence could be just Fitz Kohler showing up at the door and popping them in their nose. I mean, for starters, and we're talking about consequences, don't you think they could be the authority on that? Yeah, I could give you, I can give you a few names of, of people you can go right. and visit. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to work on that. I'm going to get, I'm going to get some sort of mask. No, nah, screw it. It'll be my own face, my brand <laughs> on behalf of fitness and the rest of the world. Uh -huh. there you go. <laughs> so one of the things you just brought up, which is a total peeve of mine and so many people fall for it is the keto diet. So let's start there tell people what you think about keto. Yeah. So, I mean, a keto diet, ketogenic diet uh, is there's many different kinds of variants of it, but in general, it's uh, higher protein, higher fat, and almost no carbohydrates. Uh, you hear of Atkins diet and, and there's different other forms of keto. There's even a plant-based keto that's out there, but really, um, you know, people can lose weight on a ketogenic diet, their numbers can get better, like their diabetes numbers. But that happens whenever you eliminate processed foods from any diet, you know. Uh, and what we really got to think about with a diet is long term health, right? We don't just want to look at weight loss, you can lose weight, if you become a cocaine addict, you can lose weight, if you get chemotherapy, that doesn't mean that's going to be good for you for the rest of your life. And that's the same thing with the ketogenic diet, about a third of people who go on it, their blood cholesterol numbers fly way high, we're talking LDL cholesterol of 300, like really high. And that's going to really clog up the arteries in the long term and increase heart disease and stroke risk. So currently I have a, I do have a, a video on YouTube called Keto Kills and it goes through all that science and specifically stating uh, that there is no major medical authority whatsoever that advocates a ketogenic diet for heart disease, for cancer prevention or treatment. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, there are some authorities that really advocate against it. It is certainly not something any of us should be doing. There is no long living culture uh, that ate that way. All the blue zones were high carbohydrate, but from unprocessed carbohydrates, not sugar and white flour. You know, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. It's a high carbohydrate food. Beans, beans, good for your heart. That's a high carbohydrate food. Those things are good for you. The key is keeping it very low in fat and really minimizing the animal foods when you're eating more of a plant-based diet. But ketogenic diet's definitely not the way to go. Why do it short term if it's not going to be good for your long-term health? You need to learn the proper lifestyle eliminate the processed foods, minimize or eliminate if you want the animal-based foods and focus on eating more unprocessed plant-based and then exercise, of course. And that's the best key to longevity. Well, you are correct, obviously, in a million ways. It's funny. There's, there's a gal in town. She's so nice. She's a lovely person other than this thing where she takes people on her nutrition plan. And I use the quotes nutrition plan because it just, she starts off by saying, remove all fruits. No fruits. You cannot eat fruits for two months or something. And I just think the second someone tells you not to eat a raspberry, unless you have shown a specific nasty reaction to raspberries, you need to cut that person out of your life and never consider their opinion again, correct? That's absolutely correct. You know, uh, again, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I mean, it, on a ketogenic diet, you can't even eat a single apple. There was a big study um, that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the uh, disease bur uh, chronic disease burden uh, research study. I forget the exact wording of it, but they said the number one thing in the American diet uh, that could be changed in order to improve uh, mortality is eating more fruit. Uh, and uh, that's definitely, definitely true, especially if you eat fruit instead of, you know, refined sugar, because uh, fruit has, yeah, sugar in it, but it's natural sugar coupled with fiber uh, and a lot of vitamins, minerals and nutrients that you need. You know, nobody's ever died eating too many apples. 
I mean, as far as I know, right? Right. Right. So, so explain to folks how sugar is necessary. And then also carbohydrates are necessary because people think, oh, I I'm low carb, I'm no carb. And they think that's winning. Well, you know, and we really, really need to remember there's two different types of carbohydrates. There's the bad ones and the healthy ones. The bad ones are the more simple carbohydrates like sugar and white flour. And those could be horrible for your health. Absolutely horrible. Uh, and the good carbohydrates are the more complex carbohydrates. They digest slower. They have a lower what we call glycemic index. Uh, they will not lead to insulin resistance in the long term. The key is when you eat, for example, like a sweet potato or something, is keeping it low fat or fat free, right? The second you put butter uh, all over your sweet potato, now uh, you're adding a, a lot of fat calories to it. And so when you're eating a, a high carbohydrate diet, like all the longest living cultures called the blue zones, you have to keep it a lower fat diet because the combination of high carb and high fat is not a good carb, uh, combination for your health. And so that's, that's the issue is people think about carbohydrates, they think of sugar, and that's why they automatically get a negative reaction uh, to carbohydrates are bad and they lump them all together. They think of potatoes, french fries and potato chips, but look at the nutrition label on french fries or potato chips, more than half the calories is the fat that they're cooked in. It's not the potato that's the problem. It's the fat is the company it keeps. So eat your carbohydrates as long as they're complex, unprocessed from plant-based sources, but don't add fat to them. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a potato junkie. I love potatoes. I'm, I'm a true Irish woman. But <laughs> I probably get, I, well, I tell people my body composition is 67% potato, but they're <laughs> a great source of energy, a great source of calories are actually not very heavy in calories. If you try to eat a normal sized potato, it's filling and it's less than 200 calories. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and they're filled with potassium. They're really good for you. Absolutely. Sweet potatoes have a little bit more of the micronutrient composition. There is something uh, that we call a satiety index, yeah. which is an index of what foods make you feel the fullest and potatoes are the highest. Uh, they definitely make you feel full. Uh, and that's why, you know, the Okinawans, one of the blue zones, the longest living cultures, 65% of their uh, of their diet was sweet potatoes. And they would just kind of slowly eat a little bit of sweet potato all throughout the day and it would keep them satisfied. Uh, very thin, vibrant culture. The Papua New Guinea Highlanders and other blue zones, 90% of their diet was sweet potatoes. And very wow. similar. Yeah, it's crazy. That's a lot. 90%. <laughs> excessive perhaps, but that's okay. <laughs> excessive with something, sweet potatoes. There you go. So Dr. Loam, what other diets do you detest? Well, you know, honestly, uh, we just, in general, you just need to understand the, the healthy, the simple rules of eliminating processed foods, less animal foods, more unprocessed plant-based. You can name it different things like a uh, vegetarian Mediterranean style diet, or, you know, people use a vague term plant-based diet, but there are other diets out there. Um, and I wouldn't use the word detest because it's a, it's a comparison. Of course, the standard American diet is horrible. I guess I detest that one. You know, a lot yeah. of burgers, fries, hot dogs, processed junk food. That's what most of America eats. The second you eliminate processed foods, you, there's different dietary patterns which are advocated and promoted, which is better than the standard American diet, things like the Whole30 diet, you may have heard of that, uh, the paleo diet. Uh, these are better than the standard American diet. They eliminate processed foods. People will lose weight on them, but is it gonna be good for your long-term long health? And the answer is no. There is actually no study that shows that a paleo diet, for example, lowers heart disease risk because there's still a lot of animal-based foods in there. It's still a little bit higher in fat. It eliminates beans uh, and uh, it eliminates dairy as well. But you know, there was a, a famous example of that. Um, the science supports that, but just a, a nice anecdotal example is a guy who was running for president a few years ago who had a heart attack on the campaign trail and his name was Bernie Sanders. Uh, and he is quoted as saying, I was paleo before paleo was a thing. I've been doing paleo for 50 years. Guess what? You had a heart attack, right? Uh, just a good example of showing how a paleo diet's not good for long-term health, too much animal-based foods. So, no matter what you call it, you know, it should be predominantly, or if you want exclusively whole food, plant-based, eliminate processed foods, less animal foods, more unprocessed plant-based. So it's interesting. I have actually, so I have interns, I hire writers and I have banished the positive use of the word diet on my website, just because diets are a specific connotation to restriction. 
right? No, absolutely. To say, yeah, you I, eat healthy. We don't have to diet. We're not children. We don't need to be slapped on the wrist. We just make these choices, right? It's our lifestyle. And that's why, yeah, we like to emphasize lifestyle. We like to say, eat more plant-based, eat more whole food plant-based. You don't need to use the D word exactly. But, uh, <laughs> and and and, uh, and we just, you know, say the more calories you get from unprocessed plant-based foods and keeping it well-balanced, the healthier you're going to be. If there's a spectrum. Uh, the higher percentage you get, the better. And there's a lot of individual variability. Every person's a little different. Not everybody needs to be close to 100% whole food plant-based to be healthy. But most people need to be at least 85 to 90 percent whole food plant based. It kind of depends on your your genetic risk and, and your overall how you respond to diet individually. So it's an interesting. So many people, I mean, they're trying to be funny. I get it. I eat bacon, 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 bacon all day, sausage and bacon. And uh, there's there's I think Joe Rogan is a big, proud carnivore to the nth degree. And what is what does your heart look like when that's your, uh, your go-to for nutrition? You got to watch my bacon video on YouTube. It's a, it's, it's a really, uh, I think it's a really good video. I threw a lot of dad jokes in there, but uh, it's not good. Uh, I mean, so you think about it, um, bacon's very high in fat. It's a processed meat. Processed meats are a class one carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. That's a cancer thing, but strongly linked to heart disease risk as well. Let me ask, why don't you pour bacon grease or animal fat down the drain because it clogs your pipes, right? So why the heck, you know, what are coronary arteries? They're the pipes that deliver blood flow to the heart muscle. And we joke uh, in the operating room a little bit that when we look at the actual plaque, when we look at it uh, in front of us with our eyes, it looks like bacon grease or cheese, one of those two, it, it looks like the fat that comes from these things. And so, and the science really shows uh, that as well, that the more processed meats, that you eat, the higher the risk is going to be. And yeah, it tastes great. Uh, I mean, people love it, but you know, you can make plant-based bacons. I know what the heck plant-based bacons. It's not going to taste the same. It might not be as high as fat, but you can make bacon out of uh, zucchini, carrots, shiitake mushrooms. Tempeh is uh, a lot of people's favorite uh, plant-based bacon. It's a uh, fermented soy, which is 40% fat. So at least it gives a little bit more of the fatty type taste and you can season it up just like bacon. Um, and, uh, yeah, not good for you. So, I mean, people say that, uh, because they don't want to hear, you know, bad news about something that they love, but it's, yeah. that's what the science shows. The science doesn't, you know, it tells the truth. So. Yeah. And I, I think it's such a tragedy that someone might be saying, well, I'm going to eat all this meat and I'm going to lose weight. I'm on this keto diet or Atkins or whatever they're doing. And they're yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their intentions are good. And then they drop dead three months, three years later, because of those actions they were promised would make them healthy, uh, much like Dr. Atkins, correct? Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, same thing. If you eliminate processed foods, you can lose weight. Diabetes numbers can get better. Look at your cholesterol, though. When people go keto or more carnivore, uh, about a third of people, their cholesterol numbers skyrocket crazy high. LDL cholesterol is of 300. So you don't really want, uh, you, you really got to focus on what's going to be good for you in the long term. Dr. Atkins himself, there was a very um, famous USDA dietary debate between Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Atkins. And Dean Ornish says, hey, listen, on a whole food plant-based diet, we've done randomized controlled clinical trials doing angiograms before one year and five years later showing you can reverse plaque if you eat plant-based. Where's your research? Where's your data? Oh, yeah, we reverse heart disease all the time. Well, well, where's your research? Uh, Dean Ornis says to Adkins, you can find this on YouTube. And he's like, oh, well, we don't have the funding like you do. And, the, and then Dean Ornis says, you've sold 25 million books. What do you mean you don't have the funding? They're, oh, OK, yes, yeah, so we'll do it. And he never did the research, never published anything uh, about heart disease prevention or reversal and died at 260 pounds and had heart disease listed on his autopsy report. So, I mean, I think that says it all. That sure does. Sure does. Yeah. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about a heart, which we can agree is probably one of the most important parts of our body. But then so. there's also the schlongs we want to save. And I love, I love your Save the Schlongs video. And I'm sure the guys listening out there are perking up a bit to hear this. And, and probably so are some of the gals. So tell us about how nutrition can save your schlong. Yeah, so erectile dysfunction is very common. They say about 50% of uh, adult American men by the age of 50 
have erectile dysfunction and a way vast majority of it has to do with the health of the arteries and you know the penile artery is a very small artery and so it's going to when it gets plaque that builds up in it it's going to manifest symptoms before bigger arteries like the coronary arteries or those to the brain so erectile dysfunction is sometimes the first thing that happens that's warning a guy hey your vascular system is not in good shape it precedes heart disease anywhere by maybe two to five years and so it's it's your penis's way of, of saying hey things aren't going good here, you know? Uh, and so many experts advocate that we should treat a man who has erectile dysfunction as a patient that has heart disease already uh, because uh, they go hand in hand. So it makes sense that the same things you do to prevent heart disease diet wise uh, can help with erectile dysfunction. And, and it works. I've had many patients um, say that this works and many comments on that video uh that um have said oh my gosh i can't believe this i i did this for three or four weeks and it's working again <laughs> so it, <laughs> it, it does work so yeah just changing your diet and your lifestyle to plant-based and doing the right things uh can do magic and have you had patients in your office and and they've had ed and then you've told them go plant-based what what is the pushback from these guys and then the reward yeah, of course. Yeah, I've had a handful of them. Of course, I, as a cardiologist, I don't have patients referred to me just for erectile dysfunction, but I do see a lot of guys with erectile dysfunction. And I try to get everybody to eat more plant-based or exclusively whole food plant-based if possible for their heart health. Uh, and so then it's just uh, the happy extra added benefit uh, is, uh, is helping with erectile dysfunction. So I have definitely had a handful of people um, that have magically uh, essentially reversed their erectile dysfunction with lifestyle changes. And uh, but the, in the bigger picture of things, they're going to live longer, too. They're going to have lower heart disease risk and, and lower stroke risk. It works. It makes complete sense. It's the same disease process that causes erectile dysfunction, heart disease and stroke. It should be the same treatment. And there's that great example in that uh, the documentary, The Game Changers, which is available on Netflix. And I think part two is coming out soon with LeBron James, where they they fed those three um I shouldn't spoil the whole video, huh? They fed those three football players different meals and measure their erections while they sleep. Uh, oh, and it's, it's, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. So you should see even what one meal can do to artery function just by that simple study. So check check it out. How interesting. Now, where does it go? If a man is experiencing ED, should they now take a, should they go see their doctor? Is that something that should concern them that their heart is also involved or the cardiovascular oh, yeah. system? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they don't see the doctor regularly enough anyways. I mean, you could have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, what we call metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or even full out diabetes. Uh, if you have erectile dysfunction, you know, you're higher risk for having those other uh, comorbid medical conditions, which increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. So definitely erectile dysfunction is not just a benign, oh man, it's not working anymore. No, no, no. You can, it's, it's a, it's a marker that, you know, you have a high risk of a heart issue coming up in the next few years. Uh, so it, it's something, it's what they always call the canary in the coal mine. Right. Uh, and so you really need to take it seriously and see your doctor and change your lifestyle. And if you go far enough, uh, like the video explains, then you, you can not only reverse erectile dysfunction, but live a lot longer. So cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of Americans. What type of symptoms would a woman experience before she went in, before she went into cardiac arrest or so forth? What could we look for? Yeah. So women are more likely to have uh, atypical type symptoms. Now, first of all, some are like a third of people, depending on what study you look at, really don't feel their heart very well. They can have, you know, severe blockages in the coronary arteries, like those two men who ran the half marathon and had the cardiac arrest. They didn't know, uh, they didn't have any symptoms, but they had a severe blockage. Uh, and um, so some women may not even feel it at all, but women are more likely to have unusual symptoms, less likely to have the classic, I have an elephant sitting on my chest with pain going down the left arm or to the jaw. They're more likely to feel it like on the right side or have feel like acid reflux or just have a vague sense of something's not right. I'm just getting fatigued with exertion or I'm just getting short of breath with exertion. And so um, it makes it hard, honestly, for patients, it makes it hard for doctors to try to determine, is this your heart or not causing these symptoms? Because it can be very vague uh, in, in women uh, and in, in diabetics as well and in elderly patients similar. And, and so we 
unfortunately have to rely on a lot of the testing in order to check and see, you know, stress tests or heart CT scans in order to see if the symptoms are from coronary disease, clogged coronary arteries. That is the number one killer in America. So I have a race I announced and we we partner with the American Heart Association and we have our heart health heroes, these women, but most of them had very they were diagnosed right at the last minute. They were short, short of breath for a while. They were nauseous. They had flu-like symptoms and just were ignoring it until thankfully something changed and they did get seen. Uh, what is your advice for us to keep, keep track of our symptoms? Yeah. I mean, whenever you got to use your judgment, it's a, it's a kind of a gut. So if you feel like something's wrong, especially if you know you have a, a risk, say a family history of heart disease or cholesterol is high or, or whatever it ends up being, don't hesitate to get things checked out. You know, it, it is you know, sometimes challenging and people don't want to be, oh, you know, uh, coming in, getting testing done, it ends up being nothing. But hey, better than that, that, you know, having it checked out and getting some reassurance that everything's okay, than, you know, risking having a big heart attack or having a cardiac arrest. So really just listen to your body. If something is off, uh, just make sure you always want to exclude the more serious things first, right? And heart disease is as serious as it gets. So if you feel like something's off, see your doctor say, hey, listen, I don't know what's going on, but could this be my heart? Uh, and, and you know, see what they say. And uh, it never hurts to do a simple treadmill test to get things checked out. So what percentage of your patients who do die, I mean, I'm sure you see a lot of people who die, what percentage do you look at and think, God damn it, this could have been avoided? Oh, geez. Oh, I mean, when it's heart disease related, um, more than 90%, the, the st statistics currently say it's uh, up to 95% of heart disease is preventable through diet and lifestyle. Uh, and so it's it's most of it. Um, more than 80% of healthcare spending in America are for lifestyle related diseases, uh, which includes everything like alcohol and tobacco and you know drugs and everything. But heart disease is the number one killer. And if the research really shows that it's at least 90 to 95% preventable through strict lifestyle changes, then, I mean, that's almost all heart disease uh, could have been avoided. Now, one of the reasons why the blue zones are so healthy is because they were doing all the proper healthy diet and lifestyle from the day they were born, from childhood. And that's it's better, better late than never, no question. But we know that heart disease, the foundation starts in childhood and slowly the plaque develops over many, many, many decades. So the sooner you get yourself in better health, uh, the better you're gonna be uh, later in life. So, I mean, it's really still blows my mind to think that the number one killer in America every year since 1919 is essentially preventable. And we know it. We have the science. We know how to do it. We have just simply actively chosen as a culture, as a food system, as a healthcare system, not to pursue this essential cure for heart disease because of culture and, and money. There's no money in healthy people. Uh, it's a multi-trillion dollar healthcare industry and we don't get paid for prevention. And our culture doesn't want to give up eating pizza and drinking soda pop and all the processed foods uh, and, and animal-based foods that they've they've grown to love. And it's just really blows your mind away, at least blows my mind away when, when I think of it that way, that we could annihilate America's number one killer instantly if we would just overcome those barriers of culture and money. So it's, uh, A, I love the word annihilate. Uh, one of the things I talk about when I talk to parents at a keynote or whatever, I always say, who would like to outlive their children? And obviously no hands go up. Nobody wants to do that. And I say, okay, well, there's a chance you're setting yourself up for failure. You might from the start be teaching your kids behaviors that will give them a certain demise way before you go. And then you have to live through the loss of your child because they died of a, of a heart attack or, or, you know, a cancer that was lifestyle related or type two diabetes. But this is, this is the thing that gets me. I remember when I was a, a new mom and I was nursing and there was a girl, a woman who was a friend of mine and she was nursing as well. And she was real high on the horse about nursing. Now, mind you, I was proud of it, but it wasn't like something I needed to force down everybody else's throat, but she did. And then the second her child moved to solid food, I caught her at the mall with a hamburger and French fries broken up on the tray of her stroller. And I just thought, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it's, it's sad. Uh, you know, we see this all the time in different cultures where the older generation in their 70s or 80s, and they grew up on a healthier diet with no processed foods. When they were kids, the processed foods weren't around and they developed those habits and they stick to it. But then the younger kids, they go to the more processed foods, heavy in sugar and oil and refined carbohydrates. 
and they become overweight and obese. And that's why uh, our America is so overweight and obese nowadays. And understanding that the disease process starts in childhood is, is critical because if you're a parent and you're not leading by example and keeping the processed foods out of your house, then you are setting your kids up for disaster. I mean, it literally, I mean, in some senses, you know, when uh, you see these, uh, you know, morbidly obese, you know, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, um, it's it almost should be considered a form of child abuse because yeah. a kid, a kid at that age, they don't know better, right? They're going to eat what tastes good to them, what gives them the most pleasure. And it's, I mean, if you gave them heroin, they would love it, right? But you're never going to give your kid heroin. That's horrible. I mean, they, they could die from that. Well, you know what? They could die from sugar. They could die from processed foods and, and red meats and processed meats too. It's really no different. And you as a parent, you need to not just lead by example, but make sure that what you're teaching your kids is something that's going to keep them healthy in the long term, uh, or else it is technically going to be your fault. They always say that the person with the most power over the health of the family is the per person who does the shopping and the cooking. I love that you said it's your fault because too many people are tiptoeing around the truth because it might be hurtful. But what really sucks is watching is burying your child. So if if your kid is overweight right now, know it's your fault. And you also have the power to make change and get that kid in shape and help on the path to health. Absolutely. No, that's that's true. First, lead by example. You need to eat healthy. Keep the processed foods out. No matter how much the kid whines or cries or throws tantrums. You got to keep it going, keep putting the healthy foods in front of them. Eventually, they'll learn the proper habits. And yeah, nobody's going to be perfect, but keep it perfect as, as you can in the house. When they go out with their friends, okay, fine. You know, it's there. I'm sure they're going to have some potato chips and some sugar. It happens. But as long as they understand the foundations of, of eating healthy, teach them some culinary skills so they know how to cook and they don't go out, you know, uh, to life and have no clue what they're doing. Uh, stress the importance of it. And uh, and you're going to raise a, a good, healthy kid who's going to have the tools that they need to be a good, healthy adult. What percentage of people who are obese can't help it? Like they're just genetically obese and there's nothing they can do about it. Very small percentage. Now, granted, there's variability, right? Uh, just like some people are more prone to diabetes, more prone to heart disease or high cholesterol. There are people who are more prone to being obese. And, and my personal story is a great example of that. Growing up, my sister was 450 pounds. My parents were over 300 pounds. I reached 270 at my highest weight. We ate a standard American diet, very unhealthy, uh, didn't exercise much. Our neighbors, they ate just as crazy bad as us and they didn't exercise, but they were thin. So they had a genetic resistance to the standard American diet where we had the genetic susceptibility. But the saying is the genes load the gun but your diet and lifestyle pulls the trigger, right? So now that I have gotten the processed foods out and eliminated the animal foods, I eat whole food plant-based and I exercise and run half marathons and marathons, I'm at my ideal body weight, six foot tall, 170 pounds. And even though I used to weigh, you know, 100 pounds heavier, my sister's lost 300 pounds. My parents have both lost more than 100 pounds. So we have the genetic susceptibility to being obese, but that's only if we eat the wrong diet and, and we don't exercise. If you do the right thing, your diet and your lifestyle is way more powerful than your uh, than your genes. And so, yeah, there's going to be some people that need to go further and they need to be stricter. Their metabolism is slow, whatever, and they're going to have to calorie restrict even further in order to maintain a healthy weight or do more physical activity. And that is the genetic component. But everybody can do it. It's just a matter of, you know, how how far they have to go. But um, genes load the gun, diet and lifestyle pulls the trigger. Magic, magic. So folks, you've heard it. If you're overweight and you've always thought, well, I'm overweight because my parents are overweight and their parents, you probably have this cultural culture within your family where they ate really poorly and now you eat really poorly. And you can be like Dr. Loam and his family. You can completely change your family tree from obesity and premature death to athletics and health. Yeah. So a lot of people, they think it's exercise and exercise is 20% of weight loss. The joke is that, oh, the reason obesity runs in my fam family is because nobody runs in my family, right? Well, no, that's not really the truth. It's because diets run in family. Uh, and so if you don't eat the right diet, that's that's the key. So absolutely fo focus on the food. Exercise is great, uh, but the key is is the food. Absolutely.
Okay, I'm switching topics because I want to know your thoughts on the popular medically prescribed weight loss drugs are, comp uh, are going ballistic around the world. All the celebrities are taking them. We see a lot about it and we hear a lot about it. Yeah, so first I'd like to say I'm not technically an obesity board certified uh, expert. People don't come to me just for weight loss, but obviously I help a lot of patients with the weight loss. I've lost weight myself. I've experienced it with my family and in lifestyle medicine. And I learned a lot about these medications, the Ozempics and the Monjaros, um, Terzapeptide, Semaglutide, all these uh, medications, because uh, back in August, I was invited to be uh, a speaker at the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine in DC. You know, Dean Ornish, Michael Greger, all these other well-known lifestyle medicine doctors were there, but they had an obesity and weight loss panel of experts. And they asked me to be on it. And I was like, wait a second, you know, again, I'm not an obesity expert. Why am I on this? And they say, well, listen, you lost 100 pounds through diet and lifestyle. We know your family's story. We know you didn't do it with medications. We'd like you to kind of show that side of things. And so I was like, okay. So in order to prepare, I did a ton of reading uh, and learning and all my uh, medical references and talking to other obesity experts about these, these medications. Because the debate uh, during this conference, there was about 3,000 physicians there, was, um, you know, are these medications really going to be the answer for everything? And it, it can be magical uh, for people. They can lose a lot of weight. But really, the way that we think about it is it's a tool. It's a tool. It is not the solution. Similar to surgical weight loss, doing gastric bypass surgery, that's not the solution for every single person who's overweight or obese is to cut their, half their stomach out. No, I mean, or put a gastric sleeve on. That's not a solution for everybody. It's a tool for some of those really bad cases where it's just really not, you know, everything else is, is unfortunately failing because the way our system is set up just doesn't promote the healthy diet. And so in those instances, we got these failures where we need more extreme measures like, you know, uh, weight loss surgery. But the medication is a lot easier than weight loss surgery, obviously. But if somebody were to go on these medications, it makes them feel full, curbs their appetite, but then they're still eating Twinkies all day. Uh, that's not going to be good for your health. Obviously, you're still going to develop a lot of diseases. Maybe it'll be lower risk because you're not eating as many calories. But the key is, is the proper content, eating more plant-based, learning the lifestyle. Uh, and if the medication helps curb your appetite and gets rid of the binging and allows you to focus on eating the proper foods and making the lifestyle changes, that's awesome. Use it as a tool not as a long-term solution uh, for everything. And so I kind of see uh, the weight loss drugs as being uh, a tool as a bridge until we fix our broken food system and our broken healthcare system, which doesn't focus on prevention and diet. And it's going to be a very great tool. Uh, it's been shown to reduce heart disease risks significantly. And so you're going to see cardiologists prescribing these. The risks to these medications seem to be pretty minimal. I mean, maybe gallstones and pancreatitis and a small percentage of people are, are getting dehydrated. Um, you know, most people tolerate it fine. And the long-term risks seem to be way less than, you know, continuing to eat an unhealthy diet and being obese. So I do think it's an important tool, but it is not the solution. The sol you, anybody, in my opinion, who goes on one of these weight loss drugs needs to be in some formal lifestyle program to teach them proper diet, exercise as an ultimate goal to saying, listen, this medicine's only going to be for whatever, six months or, or 12 months, and then you're going to get off it and you're going to be on your own. Uh, and we want you to have the tools when you're done with this medication to be able to be successful with long-term weight loss. But unfortunately, that's not always the way they're used. And there's a lot of barriers in our culture, food system and healthcare system in regards to getting people to maintain that healthy lifestyle in the long term. So a couple of questions. So I know people who are taking these drugs and they have lost weight, but their the way their stomach feels often resembled the way my stomach felt when I was doing chemotherapy. Yeah, I think um, what patients tell me, uh, and I haven't really prescribed these very much, but um, I have a lot of patients that are on them. Uh, they basically just say they get a little baseline slight nausea. They feel full all the time. And one of the big things that these medications do is they delay the emptying of the stomach. Uh, and so people eat food, but in, when it would normally empty the stomach in a few hours, it's actually taking a day or two almost. Uh, and, you know, for doctors, when we're doing anesthesia, we always want the person's stomach empty in case they, you know, vomit during the procedure, it doesn't get in their airway. And we've found out that even two weeks later, uh, after stopping these medications, 
people have delayed gastric emptying and their stomachs are still full, even though they didn't eat any, you know, any dinner or breakfast the day before, it really delays gastric emptying. And so it, it, again, it, like anything, it's variable from person to person, but the sense of feeling full, the baseline nausea is because that food is just sitting there in your stomach and it's not moving anywhere, uh, which makes you eat less. And then what about, um, I've read that it puts you at an increased risk of certain type of cancers. Yeah. And that, that association is, is a little questionable. It's thyroid cancer, um, a couple different types of thyroid cancer. Uh, and I think they're still trying to tease that out to see if that is a true risk. Uh, and I, you know, not a cancer expert, but um, it's a, whenever something comes out, there's always going to be a risk to things and, and a benefit to things. And I think the general consensus is if there is a thyroid cancer link, it's a pretty rare thing and a very low risk and the risk of dying from heart disease or stroke or diabetes complications in these overweight or obese people uh, is so high that the benefits of the medication are certainly more than, than the slight risk uh, of, of cancer, if it is even a true link. So it'll probably take another couple few years to tease that out. Got it. That's actually, uh, it's interesting because for my whole career, I've said there is no diet that works that isn't of, you know, equal threat to you. But now if you're staring down the, the barrel of a gun because you're so obese and your ha your your health is out of control and this can help you drop the weight, then perhaps it's worth it. But I see some people are maybe 30 pounds overweight that are taking these drugs. And of course, I'm not a doctor. I don't have to make those decisions. But people come to me with questions and I'd, I'd like to have an even better opinion, Dr. Lone. Yeah, no, that's, you know, so I think these the clinical trials did include people with a BMI as low as 27. Uh, which is only considered slightly overweight. Uh, and so there is there is data that, that says that even at that only slight amount of being overweight, uh, you can get clinical benefit uh, from these medications. And we do know that for health, heart health and cancer risk, the uh, best way to be is what we call ideal body weight. And it's a challenge for a lot of people to get to ideal body weight. Ideal body weight is really thin. For a five foot tall female, it's 100 pounds and you get five pounds for every inch. So if you're five foot six, that's 130 pounds. It's really thin. Uh, and uh, you know, for men, six foot tall guy, 170 pounds. And again, it's uh, five pounds for every inch. So a lot of people uh, are, you know, they're 10, 15, 20 pounds over their ideal weight, but they're not quite ideal. Is medication really that important in that scenario to get them down to ideal body weight? I don't know, but definitely people who are only slightly overweight, especially if they're pre-diabetic or diabetic, there is there is data, there is science to say that those people can benefit from these medications if they're not able to achieve weight loss without the medication. Always try without first, uh, you know, eliminating processed foods, minimize animal foods, eat more plant-based, stay physically active. If you've been doing everything you can, and your BMI is still a little bit overweight, and you have any type of metabolic risk, you know, whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, prediabetes, diabetes, all right, maybe these medications would be an option. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And I'm very excited to hear your opinion on it. Now, the next thing, really kind of the last thing I want to talk about is the dream scenario. Let's talk about real nutrition and creating a lifestyle that gets us to our point B, which is uh, we, you actually have a video on like live forever. So let's talk about food that will help us live forever. Yeah, there's a great book called How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, and he's got another one just came out, How Not to Age. It's very evidence-based. Uh, and there's a chapter in every disease state, How Not to Die from Heart Disease, How Not to Die from Stroke or Breast Cancer or Colon Cancer. It's very well done. And um, and really, you know, the power of these things is, is, you know, you have the power to make sure you're doing all the right things. I think uh, one of the famous quotes from the past president of the American College of Cardiology was, I don't mind dying. I just don't want it to be my fault. And so that's kind of one way of thinking about this. But uh, the video uh, emphasizes all the things you can do in order to live as long as possible for longevity. And the kind of joke part of it, uh, maybe not really a joke, it's, uh, I, I'm thinking it's real, is that if you can live long enough to see artificial intelligence become super intelligent, it'll solve all of our medical problems and we literally can live forever. Uh, and that's the whole premise of live forever. Uh, it's just, you gotta not die from some preventable disease first in order to maybe see that happen if artificial intelligence doesn't squish us and, and kill us all. So uh, 
it is definitely possible. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of good resources to check out for longevity. Dr. Walter Longo, there's a book called The Longevity Diet, which has all the similar concepts to how not to die. But it is it is true that if uh, if you do all the right things, you can extend your lifespan dramatically, uh, not just cancer and heart disease, but dementia, Parkinson's, and autoimmune disorders as well are all lifestyle related. A lot of people don't realize that. What are the optimum? Tell them, tell people specifically, say, ideally you will eat this every day. Or So uh, ideally no processed foods, zero, which includes anything with sugar, white flour, or added fat. So fried foods, shortening, butter, maybe little bits of olive oil are okay for, for many people, but there are some people that even olive oil uh, it's too calorie dense and they'll gain weight if they have too much. So processed foods should be eliminated. And I stress the eliminated part. Uh, people have this moderation concept. And that is not true. You shouldn't do cocaine and heroin in moderation. You shouldn't smoke cigarettes in moderation. Same thing with processed foods. So definitely easiest first rule is processed foods need to be out. Then the second rule is animal-based foods need to be dramatically reduced, if not eliminated. And everybody's different here as to how far they have to go but you want your LDL cholesterol under 70. LDL under 70 has been shown to be so protective of developing heart disease. Experts go as far as to saying that if your LDL is under 70, LDL cholesterol, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if you smoke and you're sedentary and weigh 300 pounds. If your LDL is under 70, you just don't have enough cholesterol circulating through your system to clog up your arteries. Now, granted, if you do all those other things, yeah, you might develop cancer and other diseases, but heart disease wise, uh, LDL cholesterol being low is so important. So reduce your animal foods down as low as you can, however, whatever it takes to get your LDL under 70. Uh, and so that's rule number two. And rule number three is, you know, eat a, just a ton of unprocessed plant-based and keep it well balanced. Uh, as a part of that book, How Not to Die, there is an app called Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen, which has a check boxes to help you every day. Did I eat my three servings of beans? Did I eat my vegetables, my whole grains? Did I have flax seeds for omegas? Did I drink enough water? Did I exercise? It has that check box that people can use every single day to make sure that you, you did all those things every single day. So ideally, people would eat predominantly or exclusively if you want whole food plant-based. And yes, you can get all the protein you need. The American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the world's largest nutrition organization, they have a statement that says a 100% plant-based diet is nutritionally adequate for all stages of life, including infancy, childhood, adolescence, elderly, and athletes. Check out The Game Changers on Netflix, a James Cameron film that features all these plant-based athletes, including huge bodybuilders and Scott Jurek, who ran the Appalachian Trail in 46 days. That's like something like 55 miles a day every day, 46 days in a row. He was 100% whole food plant-based that whole time during training and during the race. So you can get everything you need plant-based. And if you do it that way, you'll feel good, you'll live long, and maybe live long enough to live forever if you can just wait and see if artificial intelligence it squishes us or, or solves all our problems. Well, I hope they're not squishing us. I hope, or at least I hope it goes quickly if they do. Um, <laughs> so as a fitness pro, what I find is sometimes I give this information and uh, people will go to their doctor and, and, and to a person that is clearly unhealthy, doing the wrong thing and having bad results. It's really important when a doctor looks a patient in the eye and says, you are going down a dangerous path. You may end up with heart disease or, or worse. What, what do you want to tell these people? And I think people know. I think uh, if you're listening, just look down or think about yourself. Are you doing the right things that Dr. Loam suggested? If not, are you at risk? And, and this, is, this is what I want you to talk to those people. Yeah. So first of all, I would say that whatever your doctor tells you, don't listen unless they have specific nutrition training because doctors don't get training in nutrition. So uh, if you want nutrition advice from a doctor, seek one out that, ha that is board certified in lifestyle medicine uh, and knows what they're talking about. But uh, basically the, the main message to patients uh, almost all the time is that you have the power uh, in your own hands to be healthy. I can guide you as best as possible. Medications are not the solution. Medications can lower your risk by a percentage maybe, but that's not the issue. We have to treat the underlying cause of the problem that you have and the cause is lifestyle. Even if people think, I eat pretty healthy, I'm eating chicken and fish, I don't go to fast food all that often, I don't eat out that much. 
sometimes even that small amount is all it takes because people think it's all not that much. Oh, but it's once a week at a restaurant. Oh, and every once in a while here and there, a cookie here and there, it adds up a lot. Uh, the, the better you can be with it, the healthier you're going to be in the long term. So understanding that you have the most power over your own health is absolutely key and how important diet and lifestyle is. But then I also take it a next step and I tell people that you also can save other people's lives. Even if you're not a doctor, understanding this message, um, reading that book, How Not to Die and sharing it with others can really be powerful. You can literally save other people's lives by spreading this message of lifestyle medicine. I love you. I'm such a fan. I love you. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Is there anything you would like to add or can you tell people how they can follow you and absorb more brilliance? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I love your show. Uh, and, you know, yeah, definitely I have uh, the YouTube channel. It's just my name, Stephen Loam, uh, Lifestyle Medicine on there. I, I do have a Dr. Stephen Loam Facebook group and I'm on, I guess you call it X. It's not Twitter anymore. Um, and I, need, I admit I, I need to put up more videos and be as active. Uh, uh, I haven't been doing as much recently, but uh, every time I get on a show like this, I always get more enthused and I say, all right, let's do some more videos. And so I do have some more coming. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me, comment on videos and I can, you know, if there's questions or whatever or on this video, I'll be watching uh, when this gets posted too. Uh, and i um, happy to help as, as much as I can because I'm very passionate about this lifestyle medicine message. And literally, I feel like I've saved way more lives by making YouTube videos and spreading the, the, the power of lifestyle medicine than I have in my clinical practice or running marathons and resuscitating runners. <laughs> Which is absolutely miraculous. Folks, if you've just heard an earful and you're a little bit stressed about your past behaviors or what you're doing now, I hope you'll take this information and feel empowered. There's absolutely nothing, Dr. Loam suggested that you can't do. It's all something, no matter what your socioeconomic background, your race, your religion, your gender, any of those things are irrelevant because we can all take this information and do better. And wouldn't it be so nice if we did live forever, right? That would be great. That's, that would be great. I mean, I have my little my little five-year-old daughter. She looks at me and goes, I don't want you to get old. I don't want you to die. And so I can say, hey, there's a chance I might never die. And it makes her happy. <laughs> the, new, the new version of vampires. Um, yeah. Dr. Loam, will you tell my audience to get to work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, now is the time to do it. Don't wait. No excuse. The sooner you start, the healthier you're going to be when you get older. So get it going. Get to work, team. Hi, this is Rudy Novotny, the voice of America's marathons. We all love how much running has benefited every aspect of our lives, so much so that most of us only wish we'd started sooner. Wouldn't it be wonderful to give the opportunity to children of today? Well, you can. The Morning Mile is a before-school walking and running program that gives children the chance to start each day in an active way while enjoying fun, music, and friends. That's every child, every day. It's also supported by a wonderful system of rewards, which keeps students highly motivated and frequently congratulated. Created by our favorite fitness expert, Fitz Kohler, morning milers across the country have run over 2 million miles and are having greater success with academics, behavior, and sports because of it. The morning mile is free to the child, free to the school, and is inexpensively funded by businesses or generous individuals. Help more kids get moving in the morning by visiting morningmile.com. Champion the program at your favorite school or find out more about sponsorship opportunities. That's morningmile.com. Long may you run.